Hey folks, Professor Finn here, and welcome to the sixth edition of the Embalming History Theory and Practice uh, textbook by Sharon G. Mascarello. We want to thank Robert Mayer for his years of service with the previous editions, and welcome the new editor of the textbook. Uh, this is going to serve as an update to the existing videos I have on YouTube. Uh, so the fifth edition videos are not going to go away, um, but I am going to go ahead and take the time to update them. Uh, some notable differences between this and the fifth edition is that uh, the sixth edition of the book has much better photographs, accordingly much more graphic photographs. Um, so be advised that if you're just here kind of visiting, the entire goal and intent of these videos is to supplement what mortuary science students are learning in their funeral service education courses, embalming courses uh, at American Board of Funeral Service Education accredited courses throughout the entire United States, uh, and for the members of the general public who are interested in what we do. Uh, none of these pictures are mine. They are all embedded within the textbook itself. Uh, so if you were to purchase a digital copy of the textbook, uh, Amazon has those online, McGraw-Hill is the publisher, uh, you would be getting those photographs uh, as part of that textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. So embalming is defined by the American Board of Funeral Service Education as the chemical treatment of the dead human body to reduce the presence and growth of microorganisms, to temporarily inhibit organic decomposition, and to restore the dead human body to an acceptable, acceptable physical appearance. Now, an important thing to note here is there are many definitions of embalming. Um, in the fifth edition, I think there was something like seven different definitions. In the uh, sixth edition, they have gone, uh, the chapter editors have gone out of their way to make sure that all of the definitions are uniform. But that does not mean that embalming does not appear in different definitions in different textbooks. So one of the common things you're always going to see with the definition of embalming is that it always is going to involve some sort of chemical treatment. It is intended to slow or retard the um, decomposition of the body. We do not preserve them indefinitely. Techniques like plastination, which um, completely change the, the structure of the body, uh, are not included in the definition of consumer embalming because that would be an indefinite preservation. So we are only doing this on a temporary basis. And the way we do this is change the structure of the proteins to make them resistant to hydrolysis, as well as uh, by the fact that formaldehyde, especially formaldehyde preservatives, um, change uh, the protein structures. This is what kills microorganisms. So it is doing a good thing to the proteins of the body to prevent their destruction. And that same process kills living organisms, such as microorganisms. And finally, this is the one that um, some definitions may omit, the restoration of the dead human body to an acceptable physical appearance. It is not enough just to preserve or sanitize the body. Embalming really is intended to add to the body to get it to an acceptable appearance. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't a place for restorative art. What we are saying is restorative art starts here, okay? If you do your job well as an embalmer and you understand how the dyes work and you pay attention to how the dyes work in the products that you are using, you can achieve a very favorable cosmetic appearance without the additional need for superficial cosmetics, which is largely one of the biggest complaints that we have in the funeral service industry is the overuse of cosmetics. Um, embalming suspends the natural decomposition process thereby creating a temporary state of preservation. We've beaten that horse to, dead. to death. Ron Haas states, embalming is the best known method of presenting the decedent well through the memorial event. And that's true. Um, one of the things that we are likely going to see a swing on in the funeral service industry is the use of embalming during our funeral rites. As Things like green burial increase, and there are not a lot of products on the market that are green burial friendly. Um, we may see a decrease in the presentation of the deceased. Nothing says we can't view the deceased without embalming. There are added risks uh, involved with that that we need to be aware of. Um, but viewing the body 
during the memorial event is one of the most important tasks because by all modern grief theorists, this is an essential way to confront the reality of the death. The best way to ensure the body can remain in a condition acceptable for viewing is through embalming. Anthropo anthropological studies demonstrate that burial of the dead is the oldest of all religious customs and reverence for the dead is deeply ingrained in human nature. It is the basic ethical axiom of the funeral service profession. If people didn't care about their dead, there would be no need for us. We would be glor glorified sanitation workers. Current mourning customs, cultural practices, and religious ceremonies observe varying forms of preparation and presentation of the dead body. Well, no kidding. Every culture handles death in a different way. Roman Catholics uh, handle death and process grief uh, through their religion in a way that is somewhat different than Jews do, even though they share very common roots. The funeral mass is much different than what we see in Judaism. Americans deal with and process grief differently than Australians. Chinese differ greatly from Canadians. So we have to look at the basic factors of our upbringing, our societal development of where we live, to see how it is that we commonly grieve our dead and how the dead are prepared for those type of ceremonies. And we see reverent care is nothing new. If we go back to Neanderthals, uh, we find that there is some level of care that is given to the dead. So the book references in the uh, Shenadar Caves of northern Iraq. They found the remains of eight adults and two infants. And the, some of the dead were adorned with elk antlers, shoulder blades, and there was also evidence of flowering plants used for both decoration and to hide odors. So they're placing their dead, they're mourning their dead, and they're decorating their dead. This would imply some level of ceremony involved. Of course, in ancient Egypt, um, they elevated this to like art. Uh, the ancient Egyptians did not regard death as the end of life, but as an intermediary stage towards a better eternal life. Eternity was achieved by those who lived a virtuous life and were able to furnish their tombs and receive funerary offerings from their relatives. And there are whole courses dedicated to how the ancient Egyptian did things. When you study funeral service history, you will talk a lot about the ancient Egyptians. And Egyptology is a uh, branch of study of itself. If you weren't lucky enough to be the pharaoh and have lots of cash, uh, you attained immortality through the mercy of gods. Because, well, they needed low-end, uh, low-tier people uh, to do those tasks in the afterlife as well. Released after death, the elemental spirit, uh, the spiritual elements continued to exist so long as the body remained in a recognizable state, hence the development of mummification. In a nutshell, you had to recognize yourself uh, in order to not go mad in the Egyptian afterlife, which is why defacing of a uh, pharaoh's mummy could lead to complications in the afterlife and great efforts were undertaken that even if a grave was desecrated, that the body was in some way, shape or form restored so that uh, its soul could recognize uh, its body. The Arab proverb says it all. All the world fears time, but time fears the pyramids because these things were meant to last. And I know I am not naive that there is some argument as to what the purpose of the uh, Great Pyramids at Giza are since no bodies were found. Um, we, that exceeds the scope of this course. The funeral has always been an essential ritual of world religions. When Jacob dies in the book of Genesis in the Christian Bible, we have an account of his death. We also see uh, the account of the funeral for Joseph. Uh, the New Testament covers the funerals for Lazarus, Jesus of Nazareth. We know how people took care of their dead. 
Numerous cultures in the transcontinental region of the Middle East practice ceremonial bathing and shrouding as part of their funeral practices, which also is in Judaism. Uh, we see that when Jesus of Nazareth was uh, murdered on the cross, his body was taken down, it was cleaned, and it was wrapped and placed in a tomb according to the practices of that time, which largely in traditional Judaism and in Islam remain very close to what is practiced today. Dr. Thomas Long writes, rituals of death rest on the basic need recognized by all societies to remove the bodies of the dead from among the living. A corpse must be taken fairly quickly from here, the place of death, to somewhere else. But no healthy society has ever treated this as a perfunctory task, a mere matter of disposal, indeed. From the beginning, humans have used poetry, song, and prayer to describe the journey of the dead from here to there in symbolic even sacred terms. The dead are not simply being carted to the pit, the fire, to the river. They are traveling towards the next world, or the mystery, or to the great beyond, or heaven, or the communion of saints. And we are accompanying them that last mile of that way. The tradition of treating the dead with great reverence and respect isn't just custom. It's as old as humanity itself. It could be argued that it is ingrained in us to want to respect our dead. And as society declines, we see one of the common factors is a loss of respect for the dead. Funeral service professionals maintain the dignity of all decedents in their care through the consistent application and practice of showing respect and honor for the dead. That can be difficult for practitioners when it involves a person that society does not regard as important, such as prisoners who die, murderers, rapists, serial killers, stuff of that nature. Nonetheless, if you are a funeral professional, you are required to maintain the dignity of all decedents in your care. Once they have paid whatever debts that they have needed to pay in life, and they are delivered into our care, we must treat them with the same dignity and respect as we would treat any other client in our care. Care of the dead is both privilege and responsibility. All who care for the dead are charged with the maintenance of a moral and ethical duty. Every profession has a primary and supreme ethic in the discharge of its duties, and that supreme ethic for us in the funeral service profession is reverence for the dead. This quote appears in the fifth edition and previous editions. It appears again here, and it is a great Quote, William Everett Gladstone, a, a former uh, prime minister of Great Britain, stated, show me the manner in which a nation or community cares for its dead. And I will measure with mathematical exactness the tender sympathies of its people, their respect for the laws of the land, and their loyalty to high ideals. As I stated earlier, history suggests that the decline of governmental and sociological order can be partly attributed to the neglect of the dead. This is a common denominator we find in the downfall of civilizations, and we find it in ancient Rome, the downfall of Greece, and Nazi Germany. Sally Tisdale writes, Working with cadavers makes it clear what death is. A subject becomes an object. A person becomes a body and miraculously turns back. This body, this firm, immobile object is, was, a warm, breathing person. A body is not an ordinary object, and it can never be an ordinary object. The particular object had once been awake. All cultures attend to some form of care for their dead, some more than others. Each has developed unique rituals to implement this care. The significance of having the dead present for the memorial event demonstrates a need to maintain a connection with the dead body. Through the ages, the dead, has, uh, through the ages, the dead have been commemorated with the creation of art, music, and literature. This universal ethic of reverence for the dead is ingrained in the human psyche. Viewing the dead body is one way of confronting the stark reality of death. Seeing and touching the deceased for one last time can bring comfort. Arguably, it is the best way to confront the stark reality of death. 
Being physically present with them can foster acceptance of the otherwise unimaginable. 1955. 50,000 people in Chicago viewed the lifeless body of Emmett Till. Witnessing the unthinkable horror that was visited upon him that caused his death profoundly shaped societal views and attitudes going forward. His mother insisted that he be presented to the public in the manner in which he was murdered. And that had a dramatic effect, not just on the participants, but all persons who heard about the atrocities that were committed upon him and quite literally shaped society in the United States going forward. 1963, Jessica Mitford published The American Way of Death. It was a major attack on the funeral profession, and she was not entirely incorrect. A few months after publication, President Kennedy was murdered. 250,000 people paid their respects, and his funeral ceremonies were widely televised. However, to refer to President Kennedy as merely as a dead piece of tissue, as Jessica Mitford describes bodies in her book, wasn't taken very well by society. To dispose of his body without some ceremony would have been re reprehensible against his family and the country. So we are always weighing the value of treating our dead with respect and reverence, while also understanding that this is a business and sometimes people are just too profit oriented to do the right things so that we are encouraging proper grieving. Whenever we have soldiers that go missing or unrecovered during military conflict or war, we pay enormous amounts of money to search and recover those remains. Without the body, an essential element to the grieving process is missing. We are still finding remains from Korea, Vietnam, World War II. All of those things help bring closure to family members, even ones who have departed. Their great-great-grandkids now have a place to go mourn their great-great-grandfather or great-great-grandmother. Human beings are basically social creatures. Our social interactions take on many different dimensions. In the course of a single day, we may, we may exhibit thousands of characteristics in our interactions with each other. It is through this complex web of daily interactions that we experience life and create attachments to others. The quality of these attachments varies from one relationship to another. Within the realm of attachment between people are attachments known as deep links. Deep links are attachments that are strongly and profoundly interwoven psychological bonds and are extremely powerful. In these links, our needs for security and devotion are satisfied and virtually every part of the human psyche is involved. Through daily reinforcement of these attachments, our relationships with significant persons undergo a kind of layering process in our brains. The thoughts and feelings create perceptual patterns of recognition, and these become so familiar that there are instances in which the individual involved is frequently unaware of the depth of these attachments until the relationship is terminated. Attachments are among the most rudimentary attributes. The magnitude of these attachments are often unrealized by the person and individuals are often unaware of how deeply their behaviors and attitudes are affected. As painful as it is at times, a fact of human existence is that attachments cannot exist without grief. Imprinting by constant exposure to the attached person develops a mental photograph in our hearts and minds. In funeral service, this mental photograph is referred to as the body image. One thing that we as humans will experience, and the previous slides have indicated, we will never really truly understand how much someone means to us until they are gone. And then we come to truly realize how much that person was valued or depended upon in our lives. 
The body image that develops is reinforced unconsciously and consciously through our personal interactions with the attached person. We relate and respond to the created sensory image. We habitually relate to, recognize and identify our significant others based on the familiar body image to which our perceptions have become attached. When you have an elderly parent and you live away from them, and you come back after a period of time, say months or a year, sometimes you're shocked to see how much time has taken its toll in that short period of time or that long period of time. And until then, your mind has an image of what that person looked like. Due to this constant exposure to the body image, people often form an unrealistic expectation of permanency in the attached relationship. It becomes simple for individuals who are profoundly attached to one another to feel confident that this relationship will last forever, irrational as it may seem. It is crucial that funeral service practitioners appreciate the complex process of human attachment. We should understand better than most how we form attachments, what they mean, and what happens when they are lost. It is the psychological processes in which the ethic of reverence for the dead is based and which necessitate the need for ceremony. If we don't have attachments, we don't need funerals. We don't need ceremonies, because why would we care? A funeral is, in its most elementary form, a social function that reflects the reality of our capacity to form attachments and serves to reinforce that most human beings need to grieve and mourn their dead. Death brings with it a finality that challenges our coping skills. The bereaved are challenged to develop themselves of their close attachments to the deceased person and redirect emotional energy into relationships with others. This begins the long and often painful process of grief and mourning. One thing that you'll see with the modern grief thinkers like Warden and Wolfelt is you have to take the energy that was in that old relationship and you have to reinvest it somewhere else. Some people reinvest it in people, some people reinvest it in pets. But it must be reinvested. If you don't do those things, you remain a little bit lost at the sea, if you will, because you're missing that component of your life. Grieving begins in the bereaved psyche by sensory confrontation with a dead person's retained body image. It is often said that it is better to remember the dead as if they were alive. This is a coping mechanism triggered by an inability to accept death and, in its purest form, is a denial of death. It's true. It is best to remember people when they were vibrant and healthy. That's not the way they were when they died. And when you see that, it jars you to the reality that that is no longer the case. I have very good memories of my mother. Beautiful woman, extremely caring. I also remember what she looked like in her alternative container before she was cremated. Something very different. It is completely possible to have both of those images, to have the happy memories and have the reality that she passed and what death looks like. For honest confrontation of the reality of death, it is necessary for the mourners to see the deceased person or a symbol of the deceased person to fully accept the reality of death. There are cases absolutely where a body simply cannot be put on display. Lost at sea, cremated during say an airplane accident or in a building fire and there's nothing left to view. In which case, an empty casket goes a long way. An urn will fill in symbolically for those things. It is always best to be able to view the dead body, to confront the fact that person is gone, not the symbol of the loss, but the actual person being lost. But if you can't have that, then the symbol is a good close second. 
When the body of the deceased is unrecoverable, no chance exists to establish the reality of death. In this case, there is a risk that mourners will experience complicated grief that lacks resolution. And when you deal with complicated grief, chances are pretty good you may need some help working through that. Emotional confrontation of the reality of death can be achieved when mourners can physically approach the deceased or symbol of the deceased. Viewing and touching a dead human body is an effective way for the bereaved to accept the finality of grief. Denial can manifest as an avoidance of contact of the reality of death, namely the dead person's body. You don't want to see the body because it makes it real. This avoidance may appear as though the bereaved is trying to simply maintain composure. We all are conditioned by society to act a certain way. Boys aren't supposed to express emotions. You need to be strong for your family. You're the one in charge now. I have heard all of these things. And the reality is, you might be the one in charge now. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't cry. That doesn't mean you should not let your emotions take their toll. You have to express. Bereavement is not a simple process that can be managed by rational thought alone. Grief is an emotional, not a rational process. As much as we would like to think it through, sometimes you just have to cry because that's what your body demands. The comprehension of human separation can never be accomplished through intellectual rationalizations. Often those who are the most aggrieved by the death are the ones who would most benefit from accepting the reality of the death. Dr. Eric Lindemann has suggested that there is no escaping the slow wisdom of grief. The avoidance of the dead body is always done at the psychological peril of the aggrieved. This avoidance may appear at first to be consoling, but in truth, cancellation is just an illusion. In time, the necessity to view the body becomes a major issue in post-bereavement care. Lindemann offers that a common characteristic in persons experiencing complicated bereavement is an inability to recall a clear mental image of the body in death. Establishment of this mental image is an essential ingredient in creating a strong foundation for the subsequent steps in the grieving process. An unclear image of the deceased person or no image at all fosters a lack of full acceptance of the reality of death. I don't know what it would have been like had I not seen my mother after she passed. I would have the last images in my head of her in her hospice bed in the preliminary stages of dying. It is impossible for me to think how I would perceive things because I have seen her in death. I do know that I had a very good friend in college who passed away, a uh, result of a drunk driver. And I still have a picture of him, vibrant and healthy, and I still think about him to this day. I know he is dead. I know I will never see him again in this life, and I will have no more shared experiences with him in this life. But I have seen no urn, I have seen no grave, I have seen no casket. I see nothing. Only my friend in college. There seems to be something missing there, and it has been decades since he passed. Lindemann believed that the most significant benefit of the funeral and embalming is achieved at that moment when the finality of the death is fully comprehended by the bereaved person. purpose for all of that happens when you recognize the person is dead. When everything clicks, whether you like it or not. It is this moment of truth that serves as the psychological framework for the validation of embalming. 
The embalmed body is a stark confrontation and there is no denying the finality of death. We're not made, we're not supposed to make the bodies look like they're sleeping. We're supposed to make the bodies look good in death so we can grieve. So that the body image shows them dead but at peace. And people will argue about that. In fact, you can go back and read the um, the statements made at the time that President Abraham Lincoln was killed. He looked as if he was in a deep sleep or just taking a nap. That is a form of death denial. Entrenched in the makeup of humankind is a ritualistic behavior that a breakdown or corruption of these life rituals may result in a human cataclysm. This is cute. We all have our rituals. When our, inter when our rituals get interrupted, we tend to be off. There's a little bit of chaos that was introduced in our lives. And it could be something as simple as being rushed in the morning because you woke up after your alarm or your alarm didn't go off. And your morning ritual cannot happen in its normal sequence. And that can throw off the entire rest of your day. Dr. Carl Jung so human psychological life is a universal phenomenon, whereby identification with what he termed the collective unconscious linked all humanity together. Although we differ greatly in a variety of different areas, some shared constants exist that we can all identify with and understand. An archetype of our collective unconscious is the funeral event. We know when we see a bunch of people standing at a gravesite, what they are doing, what is happening, and we in some way can relate and feel a little bit sad for what is happening. We are linked in. This is also something that um, if you do any sort of metaphysical studies, this linkage forms a basis for metaphysical studies this emotional connection, this energy that is emitted from these experiences. The practical purpose of embalming is to slow the degenerative changes that occur naturally after death. This allows the bereaved time to make important decisions. Embalming permits the family and friends to engage in the emotionally healing process of leave taking. Can we do this just with refrigeration? Absolutely. We can certainly store the body for a temporary period of time in a refrigeration uh, with very little, if any, ill effects. At some point, even refrigeration takes its toll. But if we stabilize the body with embalming, we even have more time with the body in refrigeration. Embalming is a very important task if we have to have time to put things together. To fully implement the ethical, psychological, and sociological benefits for funerals of the funeral, people require time for assimilation. Time is required to organize, think about, and participate in funerals. Time is also required to assimilate all that has happened and acknowledge that their lives have been changed. You might not get it immediately, but you'll get the benefit later because it takes time to settle in. When my mother passed away, I contacted the church. I set up the funeral. I'm the one that ran the door. I'm the one that participated in the mass. I'm the one that did the cantering. And you know what? I completely missed the funeral. I was so involved with every aspect of it. I received none of the benefit of it. I didn't sit with my family. I didn't sit with my friends. I was too busy working it. Linda Chetelin Fell states, the bereaved need more than just space to grieve the loss. They also need the space to grieve the transition. Excuse me. Ethics is the science of rectitude and duty. Its subject is morality and its sphere is virtuous conduct. It is concerned with the various aspects of rights and obligations. 
Ethics is a set of principles that governs the conduct for the purpose of establishing harmony in all human relations. For practical purposes, ethics is fair play. It serves as a guide in promoting professional attitudes and ensuring ethical conduct. Sound and practical judgment, called judicious counsel, is to be exercised in all professional interactions. Funeral service professionals should maintain a neutral position in serving the public at large. Courtesy, tact, and discretion should characterize all of the embalmer's professional actions. I have long taught and long said, we as funeral professionals live in a fishbowl. And a great example of this is the one I always offer to students and people and live streams and anyone who asks. It is my custom on St. Patrick's Day to go out and have a hell of a good time. One St. Patrick's Day, I was out in typical form, getting quite inebriated, when another person at the Irish pub I was at wanted to buy me a drink. I don't know this person. I remember this person. I don't know, whatever. Not in the custom of just accepting drinks from random drunk people. But this person insisted. And he, then he said, I want to buy you a drink because you're the funeral director that ran my grandfather's funeral and it was a great funeral, etc. And I asked him his grandfather's name. He told me his grandfather's name. And I recalled the funeral, I recalled all the aspects, all the members of the family, and couldn't remember what this person's relation was. Um, I think he was one of the grandsons, which you don't use to get the grandsons at the table making the arrangements, right? But I remembered the story. I remembered his grandfather's life and remember what was said during the funeral, which is why it's important that we stay in the room for funerals. Just don't walk away and go work on paperwork or something. And I toasted his grandfather with my free beer, wished him well, said if he has any other things he needs to talk about that, you know, we, me, the professional, were there for all the family members. So call if you have questions. Call if you need to talk. That is the last time I've got inebriated on a St. Patrick's Day in public. To this day, I do not tend to drink to any level of excess in public because courtesy, tact, and discretion should characterize all of my professional actions, including how I present myself publicly when I am out of my daily tasks. When the performance of duty requires licensure, the embalmer must never aid or abet any unlicensed person who engages an unlicensed activity. Plain and simple. You do not allow people to do the work that are not legally permitted to do so. And you should never, ever, ever allow others to do it. You are risking your license in the process. All personal information must be regarded as confidential. The embalmer is privy to information that must never be shared outside of the performance of duty. It is not just the manner or death or condition of the body that must be held in strict confidence, but different attention to different details. If a service is private, it's private. Don't talk about it. Like it or not, one of the most recognizable names in Western civilization is Adolf Hitler former chancellor of Nazi Germany. Hitler suffered from a condition called monoorcosis uh, or orchidosis. Both of, the, both of those names are, are um, printed in the textbook. It is the condition of having one testicle. The greatest secret of Nazi Germany was that Adolf Hitler only had one testicle. Only three people knew it, if I recall. Or maybe it was only the two, I don't remember for, for certain right now. Hitler's physician, 
and Hitler. Maybe Goebbels. That's it. That secret was kept. And that is the way we need to be as funeral directors and embalmers. The secret is kept. You do not discuss things. You do not post them on forums. You don't get drunk and talk about things at the bar. Confidentiality is confidentiality. Insinuations, non-factual statements, or overplay of facts that have the intent or effect of harming another professional are unethical and must be avoided. There are polite ways of saying someone is not the best embalmer in the world. Be courteous to other professionals. If a person has a bad embalming experience with another professional, well, you know, it's because they barely passed mortuary school. If you don't know that, don't say it. Regret that that person had an unfortunate experience. You don't know what that embalmer got into. I get contracted at least a couple times a year to look at expert witness testimony involving or to provide expert witness testimony for funeral service related court cases. Generally, embalming comes up a lot. Whenever I meet with attorney and they give me the facts for whatever side they represent, I can paint a picture. I can kind of understand what's going on. I have ideas why things happened the way that they did. But until I see an embalming report, until I see the deposition, I really don't know what is happening. Insinuations, non-factual statements, overplay of facts. And whenever I analyze something, it is always what is the likely reason something happened, what are other possible ways it could have happened, and what is absolutely false about what I am seeing. You cannot say you've been treating the cavities twice a day for three days straight and still have some sort of gross expansion of the viscera. You simply can't. Either you're using the wrong chemical or you don't know what you're doing. Those are the only two possible explanations. The embalmer is responsible for maintaining the proper identification of the body through the various stages of preparation and until the time of final disposition. You are keeping an eye and you are tracking it. The embalmer must observe all legal and regulatory requirements, federal, state, or local governments and municipalities. We are regulated up the wazoo. The embalmer has a moral and ethical duty to maintain skills commensurate with professional practice. I have long told people when they are taking embalming labs, if you suck at this, stay out of the prep room. By body number 50, by body number 60, if you have not shown significant improvement in understanding what you are doing and getting passable results, you are likely not going to be an asset to anyone's prep room. You may have all the book knowledge in the world. You're simply just not that good at it. There are plenty of people that can talk statist uh, statistics about sports. That doesn't mean they're playing for a triple A team. Opportunities for continuing education are numerous and readily accessible both in person and remotely. Now more than ever, I can go on Facebook and I can see people like Ben Schmidt offering webinars, Damon De La Cruz offering webinars through Frigid Fluid, Monica Torres offering workshops. Every one of these people is extremely talented at what they do. There are so many people out there providing professional education to get better at what you do. I've attended workshops by, from Matt Smith. I think I've sat in on at least one workshop by Monica Torres. I've heard Ben speak. I've heard Damon speak. I've heard so many people that are educators and professionals speak. And every single time I listen to them, I always learn something new. And I have taught embalming now for almost 15 years. Some of you may even respect me as an embalmer. God knows why. 
If I am listening to these people and I am learning something, I promise you, you will likely learn something too. Many states require a minimum number of continuing education credits to maintain licensure. I'm licensed in Florida. I'm unlikely to get licensed in any other state just because I hate doing extra continuing ed. You must do continuing ed to maintain your license. If your ethical responsibility to maintain a clean and it is your ethical responsibility to maintain a clean and sanitary work environment. Offer personal protective equipment to any person allowed access to the prep room, restrict entry to unauthorized persons, and maintain coverage of sheltered human remains. And some of you are going off right now. It's not my job to offer PPEs to individuals that are non-employees. We are required by OSHA only to offer PPE to people that are our employees, not third-party contractors, etc. The truth is, you're not, unless your state laws require it, but federal OSHA, not so much you must provide for PPEs for your employees. That does not remove your liability if people get sick, especially if you're having clients go in there or apprentices or students. The amount of money that you spend protecting people in the prep room is insignificant in comparison to a lawsuit, period. Embalming must be authorized by expressed or written permission prior to the performance of the procedure. An embalming and decedent care report should be completed for every decedent. So in the fifth edition prior and prior editions, they talked about embalming reports or other different reports for different purposes, depending on what chapter you were in. One of the things that was normalized in the sixth edition book is it is now called an embalming and decedent care report. So if you are looking at one of the other editions or you are a graduate or uh, a person that is involved in the industry, whenever you see this embalming and decedent care report, this is the embalming report. The name change is important because all too often you'll get an embalming report. It just shows you what you did during the embalming procedure, what chemicals you used, how much you injected, where you injected it, and what supplemental techniques you might have had to use, like where'd you put the hypodermic needles, did you hypotrochar the legs, etc. Decedent care insinuates post-embalming care. What did you do after? Did you re-aspirate and re-inject? What other supplemental techniques did you use two days later? What type of cosmetics did you have to apply? What did you notice as time passed? The embalming and decedent care report is more thorough. Personal effects should be documented and securely maintained. Photographs may only be taken in the performance of duty. Authorized photographs must be safeguarded both digitally and physically to ensure confidentiality. It is wise and prudent for the embalmer to secure permission from the authorizing agent prior to taking photographs. If you have it built in your model that you take photographs, it needs to be in your embalming authorization. Remember it said expressed or written permission? You can ask for permission but then must obtain written permission when they come to the funeral home and you meet face to face. So during the removal, get the okay. When they come to make arrangements, get it in writing. Your embalming authorization should state whether or not you take photographs, for what purposes you take photographs for, and the steps that you take to protect them, how you store them and how you dispose of them. If you are just taking photographs for your portfolio, the family still has to be aware that you're doing that and should still have the ability to say, no, we don't want you to take photographs of our loved one. And if they say no, you can't do it on the sly. Funeral practitioners must ensure the dignity of human remains at all times. At a minimum, this is the use of modesty cloths, covering genitalia, things of that nature. Transferring practices from the place of death are accomplished in the same manner that is respectful and involves the same level of care afforded a living patient. You should be treating the dead bodies at the same level, if not better, than what is given to a living patient. All mortuary equipment should be maintained in a clean and sanitary condition. Take preventative maintenance. Replace springs. Oil things need to be oiled on your cots. Change the mattresses on your cots as they wear out. If something is soiled, 
clean it, have spares. The modesty of the deceased person is maintained while coverings are removed. Universal precautions are strictly observed. There are times when we do not have any clothing on the body, and that is primarily during initial bathing and terminal bathing, because we have to clean everything. At all other times, there should be some coverings on the body to protect their dignity. The American Society for Embalmers created a best practices document to support the exemplary practice of embalming. So it is out there if you wish to see it. Treat all deceased human remains with thoughtful care, maintain dignity, and show respect at all times. Be knowledgeable of and in compliance with all regulatory authorities that govern the preparation and disposition of deceased human remains. Prior to the rise, um, prior to the rise, the use of excellent communication among all funeral professionals involved with the decedent and family. Something's wrong there, but what this comes down to is um, make sure you're talking to and communicating with everyone involved, including your clients. Authorizations for embalming and restorative art procedures must be shared with the embalmer, preferably in writing. Don't just call and tell. Make sure you got the authorization. Let them see it's okay to go ahead and proceed with certain things and be very clear what it is to be done. And above all else, confirm the identity of the deceased prior to the commencement of any procedures. There was lots and lots of debate over what is the first thing that you should do in embalming. And that depends on what chapter in the old book you were reading. But arguably, the most important thing that you would do, the very first thing that you would check before you do anything, is check the identity. If you have the wrong bag, you should not be spraying or terminally disinfecting at that point. You have the wrong body bag. You have the wrong person. Check IDs. The preparation room should be kept private and all local, state, and federal law should be observed as to its use. A lot of people view this as no one should ever be let into the prep room for any reason. And the answer is no, that is not true. It is widely accepted among top-tier funeral homes and widely printed in textbooks that there should be no areas of your funeral home that you do not bring members of the public into to let them see. This does not mean that you give them carte blanche to walk in and out of the prep room. It should be kept private, especially if you have bodies in there. But if you have no bodies in your prep room and a family wants to see the prep room to see how clean it is or what it looks like, there is no reason on earth you shouldn't be able to walk them back to your prep room, show them the prep room so they can see how you maintain your prep room and how you run your business, and give them the peace of mind of knowing that what they're paying for is commensurate with the quality of which you run your business, keep the place clean. Share information regarding the care of the deceased between the director and the embalmer. All too often, people don't update the notes in their computer systems. All too often, they don't just don't pick up the phone and call and say, hey, giving you a heads up. I'll follow up with an email when I'm done, but you need to know this now. Always call and talk to each other. If the family's coming in, and they have a concern about something, be right on the phone with the embalmer. Hey, hold up a second. You need to know about this. I'm sorting this out. Don't do anything till I call you back. Would you like to speak with the family? Which is why it's important for those of you who just want to be embalmers, who don't want to have to talk to family members, wake up call. You are entering an era of practice where you will have licensed funeral directors that are not licensed embalmers. And you are the only person who can talk to the family so you must have the vocabulary and the soft skills to be able to communicate with them effectively telephonically or even virtually. Obtain information about the overall condition of the remains. Obtain information about the cause or nature of death, time of services. Make sure that you are taking your time and being thorough in the embalming process. I get it, time is money. The more you can blow through, the more money you make, the more efficient you are, the better your bottom line. There's a reason why I see lots of people have legs that go bad. Because you are injecting too quickly, you are not establishing thorough preservation in the legs, and it is not 
taking because you don't have a sufficient quantity of fluid getting into those distal areas. And I'm talking about the people that inject the body and are done in 30 to 40 minutes. That is a near impossibility to ensure thorough saturation of the distal areas of the legs. And so then what do you do? You go in with the hypovalve trocar and you attack the legs with that. Oh, the legs just didn't take. They didn't take because you weren't thorough. You're fast and you're sloppy. That's what it comes down to. And if you would have taken the extra 10 or 15 minutes, let the perfusion take place, you'd likely have better results. And address and remedy problems in bombing and shipping situations immediately. Don't wait to see what happens. Be proactive. That little bit of gel you're going to use, that little bit of cotton you're going to need to use, much better than waiting to see if it is going to develop in the skin slip. All documents, photographs, and personal information about the deceased must be kept in strict confidence and under secure storage. That means if it is in a file that is on your desk, the file should be kept inside of the desk locked up somewhere. Or you should be using files that have no clear covers on them or cover sheets that hide the contents and securely restricting people who come into your office who can page through your file. If you're storing things digitally, you should be encrypting your hard drives. Have secure passwords for all of your internet. Have make, make sure your people are trained against cybersecurity attacks so they're not clicking on stupid emails. These emails are getting better and better. It is not that easy to detect if it is a malicious email. Only those persons designated and authorized by the funeral establishment or family may be allowed attendance during the preparation of remains. Listen to what that just said. The family can authorize someone to be in your prep room. Okay? They can, rep they can appoint someone as their representative. They may attend themselves. They have the right to control that. Photographs of deceased remains must never be placed on social media sites or shown in public places to non-funeral professionals outside the educational setting. And even then, if you're in the educational setting, you are likely complying with your institution's media requirements, which usually state that you must have permission to use photographs. That's why when they come in and they take pictures of your classroom, they have to get a release of all the people that are there. And if the people don't want to sign a release, they can't be in the photograph. It's that simple. I have plenty of photographs that I've received uh, as part of my expert witness work. I do not share them even in the educational setting. I might talk about some of the cases. I won't mention names. I won't mention dates. But I will mention what I have seen. Because I do not know that I have the permission to even share or talk about those photographs. Respect and comply without comment with the wishes of the family or the deceased requesting organ or tissue donation, hospital or forensic autopsy, or full, bo full body donation to science. They have the paramount right of disposition to control what happens to that body. It is not up to you to decide whether or not it is inconvenient for you to have to go ahead and do an autopsy embalming. If they want to do an autopsy, they're going to do an autopsy. They want to do tissue donation, do tissue donation. You should have the skills to be able to adapt to all of those, including all of the inconveniences that come with some of those techniques. Professional conduct will ensure that embalmers will not knowingly allow non-licensed embalmers to practice embalming and that they will not participate in derogatory public comments about other embalmers. I have no reason to talk smack about anybody else. There are people out there I don't like. There are people out there that I'd probably you know, go so far to say I can't stand. I won't mention who they are. Period. That's irrelevant. Completely. If they do good work, they do good work. If people think they do good work, let them believe they do good work. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If they suck at what they do, chances are pretty good at some point that is going to catch up with them. And if they're unlicensed, I can absolutely report them to the state, and it is my obligation to report them to the state. In the state of Florida, if I am witnessing unlicensed work, I am under a legal obligation to let the division know that someone is performing embalming without a license. Because if it turns out that I was there and I allowed it, my license is on the line.
Always pursue ongoing and continuing education opportunities for the embalmer. You always pick something up. You'll learn something new. And some of the things you'll pick up just make you feel stupid because you didn't think of, think of them up first. I can't tell you how many times I've walked away from summer school and, man, why didn't I think of that? That is like brainless. I should have figured that out. Practice thorough and complete preservation of the entire remains. Understand how diffusion works. Do the sectional injection, then do the trocar treatment. It is always best to get the tissue to diffuse than it is to just go in and try to do hypodermic and topical treatments. Do the job well. And if you notice something isn't working, then don't be afraid to do all those other things. Yes, they are time consuming. Yes, they can be annoying, but it is thorough and good work. Document all remains that enter your funeral facility on a preparation care form. Include remains for identification only, storage, embalming, ship in or ship out. In the fifth, this is not a departure from the fifth edition or the previous editions. Your fifth edition and previous said that anybody that comes into the funeral home, you should inspect the remains, you should notate the remains on an embalming report, even if you are not embalming, so that you have a record of what this body looks like in any of its conditions as part of the official record. What we are saying now is there should be a form specifically for that. When a body is received, we look it over. Why? So it cannot be inferred that the body may have been embalmed. There is a separate form to check in and note conditions. There is another form for when you embalm and the things you did then and after. Be knowledgeable of the multiple methods of treating all types of embalming cases, regardless of their condition. Practice custodial care. Monitor remains until final disposition and make corrections as needed. If I was to sum up the last three cases that were embalming related um, that I've been engaged with for expert witness, let me tell you, failure to maintain. That's all it is. You embalmed it. They might have been good when you embalmed it, but then you left them in the fridge for a couple of weeks and you didn't bother looking at them again. And it is not an excuse that you use a third party service to do your embalming or storage. They need to be checking. When you embalm a body, you are not done, not by any stretch of the imagination. You have just started. But the good news is, if you've done your job well, you will only have to do slight maintenance as time progresses. Maybe add a little bit of humectant to cotton to prevent some dehydration in an area. Maybe touch up some massage cream or stone oil to prevent dehydration. Maybe put a cavity compress or a gel compress uh, on an external area that isn't quite holding up after a couple of days. Maybe have to go in there with a hypodermic needle and some cavity fluid to treat that area that didn't quite go the way it should have. And you're seeing that after a couple of days. But how long does it take to put a little bit of hyper cavity fluid into a hypodermic needle and get it done? How much time does it take to take out the autopsy gel, put it in some cotton, and apply it? It takes no time whatsoever. Get it done. And above all else, Ask for help. If you don't know what you're doing, if you have questions, call and ask. There, you could talk to any one of the embalmers out there that are bouncing around on social media. Any one of them. And ask a very simple question. Do you have a person that you call and ask when you have questions? When you're running into something you haven't seen before? Yes or no? The overwhelming majority will answer yes. Absolutely. Especially when they were starting out. Everyone has their mentor. And they bump into something, they call and ask. Or they'll send a message. Hey, this is my situation. This is what I'm thinking of doing. What do you think about that? It happens all the time. Protect yourself from the potential hazards. Infectious, chemical, and physical. There are certain instances where the employer must provide some things and only have to provide other things when it crosses a certain line. You are welcome to take matters into your own hands if you want and purchase your own gear. But you're also responsible for maintaining it.
The establishment ownership and the embalming practitioner agree to have available all the necessary supplies, chemicals, dry goods, and equipment to prepare every type of embalming case. This doesn't mean that you have the entire catalog of chemicals from a chemical supplier. But it means you have a couple of different chemicals for different types of cases. I have walked in the prep rooms and I have seen one cavity chemical and one arterial chemical. And I mean bottles by the dozens. That's all I need. All I need is intrafiant with Dynachrome and all I need is uh, Primacav 50. Could you embalm with that stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. But why do some bodies get dried out quicker? Why do they have the wrong color and you have to use a lot of cosmetic? Because you're using the wrong chemical for the wrong jobs. You should not be using Intrafine old time or with Dynachrome or old time color on a normal 90 year old who weighs like, you know, 85 pounds. There is no need for that unless there is something that is triggering the use of that chemical. But if you wanted to aim high, maybe you could do Plasto 25, maybe do Triton 28 if you're, if you're in the Pierce line. Maybe you go a little bit less. Maybe use a Chromatech. Maybe you do AOK. -okay. You should have something that is high end for complicated cases, something for normal bodies, and then usually you have a couple of specialty chemicals, like one for jaundice or something like that. Because we'll talk more about super diluting your chemical to make it appropriate for jaundice, and that is not the most effectual way that you should be doing it. But just having one chemical not the best way to do it and i've seen people run entire funeral homes on that concept but is it the best way to do it probably not and above all else the preparation room and adjoining facilities must be maintained in a clean and sanitary condition i know in the state of florida there is a clean and presentable requirement in the prep room. That if a state inspector goes in and looks at your prep room and it is disgusting, they will write you up for it. And mind you, when I have read the reports of when people do get cited for things like that, these are not arbitrary, eh, your full floor looks dirty. This is, it's not just dirty, it is a hazard to the health and safety of employees and others, if not a downright violation of law. I mean, it is disgusting what some of these inspectors have to write about when they are reporting them to the state for cleanliness issues. So folks, welcome to the sixth edition, and I'll see you next video.